sorry for that. Um, so thank you for indulging me. I just, it was hard yeah. to, to focus. I wanted to make sure I was giving you my best answers there. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, so I, like I said, I'm a woman. I identify as a female. I started my research understanding women's sexual desire. And what just struck me over time is that we were getting more and more used to um, you know, the complexities of women's experiences, when women were in the mood, all the different things that could impact their, um, their interest, when we were, when we weren't feeling it. Um, you know, we were talking about the role of motherhood, the role of medications, our, you know, our day, our stress load, all of this stuff. And I started realizing that we were always kind of using this comparison, that we were talking about, unlike men who were kind of mm. thought of as having this higher level of sexual interest, we were talking about all these complexities of women's desire. And so, it just kind of naturally um, happened one day. I was talking with a, a colleague around, you know, like, it, are men really always in the mood? Like, you know, we kind of talk about it like that. Like, uh, you know, I'm always ready to go as soon as my partner's interested, right there, like all in. And, and I just thought, I was like, we, we're kind of assuming without really knowing. And so I was really curious to actually talk to men. Um, I did some face-to-face um, -face interviews. So it was a smaller study that started this all. Um, so I did 30 in-depth interviews. These were with heterosexual men. Um, they were in longer term relationships. And I just kind of went into those interviews and just asked, you know, tell me about yourself. Tell me about when you're interested. Are there ever times that you're not? And just what struck mm -hmm. me is that, you know, men kind of started some of the conversations by saying, oh, yeah, you know, I'm always interested or, you know, when she wants it, I'm down. Um, yeah. but, it, but it didn't take long um, during the conversation for men to say things like, you know, oh, well, you know, when I'm sick or if I'm tired. And then they started getting into the more interesting things, which was like if there was an emotional disconnect, um, mm. if they weren't feeling so close, um, that they really felt like those were times where they're maybe not feeling so excited about sexual activity and they might not be in the mood at all. Mm -hmm. um, so we can talk and about what age group are we talking yeah, so the first group of men that I talked to were between the ages of 30 and 65. Um, and so I was kind of particularly interested in what happens like as we get a little bit older. Not to say that 30 is old, I'm older than 30, but, but just the idea of like not focusing on the traditional 18 to 25 year old sample that gets used a lot, um, mm -hmm. you know, in the college age sample. Um, yeah. which can be, you know, some men reflect on that time as maybe when their sexual desire was kind of at more of like a high, you know, hormones are, are raging and there's a bit more of that interest. But over time, you know, entry into fatherhood, uh, other stresses, paying rent, paying mortgage, jobs, all that stuff kind of starts making sex still important for a lot of men. But, you know, it also is impacted by a lot more things. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. I'm curious if any of the guys in the group feel comfortable sharing um, if they can relate to any of this, if there have been moments where in their relationship there's been um, some conflict or some emotional distance and it's impacted their sexual desire. I actually, in preparing for this interview, I thought about uh, an experience that's really indelible in my mind. Um, and it wasn't with a man in a long-term relationship. It was actually in the earlier stages of us dating. Uh, but we had always had really great sexual chemistry. And we had decided to go on a day trip together to um, the Indiana Dunes. And I had kind of playfully suggested, I'm like, do you have a tent? You know, we could have sex on the beach if, if we pack a tent and bring it along. And he was very enthusiastic. Um, and then when the actual day of happened, we had to kind of park far away from the beach and, and walk. And it was maybe like a two mile walk just because of where the parking lot was. And he, you know, offered to carry the tent and we, you know, got over to the beach and we were there. And, you know, I, I suggested we set it up and he declined. Mm -hmm. You know, he's like, oh, it's hot. We'll get sticky. And it was such an odd moment for me. Because in my head, I'm like, I know we have physical attraction. Aren't guys always in the mood? And that was actually one of our very last dates. Um, you know, he was just out of a long-term relationship. And I think there were some elements that weren't a good fit, you know. Yeah. Um, and what but it was... Yeah, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt, but what you're speaking to, I think, is such a common reaction that women particularly have when they are with a male partner is because we all are growing up in a society and we have this idea that men should always want sex. And so particularly when you're describing yourself as being 
eager, excited, kind of creative about a possibility of how that would happen, for him to not want it kind of goes against the grain. And, and so a lot of women can take that really personally. I'm not sure the degree to which you experienced that, but mm -hmm. you said it was the last, <laughs> the last date. But the yeah. idea of like, are you not attracted to me? Are you not as into this? Is there something going on with you? Um, whereas we don't really have that same narrative. If a woman turns down no. sex early on dating, then it's kind of considered like normal or perfectly okay. Um, right. And, and so it's, it's just interesting how often I think that, that a lot of women actually take it quite personally when there could be a whole um, list of reasons that maybe he wasn't so interested at that particular time that had potentially nothing to do with you. Or, you know, like it, there's a lot of things going on that we yeah. don't tend to talk about there. Yeah. And what I love about your work is it's made me aware of, I think at the time prior to reading your book, there was an element of shaming. Mm -hmm. Not that I shamed him, but in my head, it was like, aren't guys always in the mood? Like something must be really wrong. Yeah. Um, whereas really there was just some emotional distance. And I actually commend him for honoring, you know, how he was feeling versus just going through the motions because he felt like as a man, that's what he needs to do in order to, you know, save face or be masculine. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, over the course of the interviews that I told you about before, but I also did a larger online study. And then of course I'm a therapist. So I see, you know, several men in my, in my practice over the last decade of, of being in practice. Um, but, but that was one of the things that, that often came up is that men too, a lot of men describe having this idea of what is expected of them. And that includes saying yes to sexual opportunities, even when they're not feeling so excited about it. Uh, it included even initiating sex that they weren't that excited about. And so men were very much aware, at least over the course of my research, that there was this idea of what the traditional masculine, um, you know, assumptions are and how they should fit into them. But they said in a lot of cases, it didn't always fit their true experiences. Um, and so one of the reasons that they were kind of doing that, initiating sex or saying yes to sex they weren't as excited about, um, sometimes came from kind of an internalized idea of what they should do, right? It kind of came from that social level. But a lot of men also said that they were worried about what their female partner was going to say or how they were going to react. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's interesting that you're just talking about giving that space and saying, you know what, like maybe in my head, I was kind of going through some, some reactions, but to kind of say, you know what, I'd rather not have sex with someone who doesn't want it. Like that is a very good, healthy perspective to have that we want, no matter what the gender, no matter what the relationship. So, um, but yeah, what yeah. you're speaking to, it definitely showed up a lot over the course of my research. Yeah. So g given how tied emotions are to male sexuality, and for anyone who's curious, you know, dive deeper into Sarah's book or some of the other interviews she's done. But I'm curious, let's say you're a woman um, in a relationship with a man, and you want to have a conscious relationship and you want to have communication. What are some things that women can do or say that acknowledge the emotional element of male sexuality and, mm -hmm. and allow them to kind of be true to that and, and honor that, not in a way that feels patronizing, but in a way that feels like kind of freeing, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, really great questions. I, uh, my first um, thought is basically be curious. I mean, instead of making an assumption that you should want sex or like why you'd be in the mood or why you're saying no and taking it personally, I think it's, it's important to be curious whether um, he has a higher sex drive because, you know, a lot of the men in my research do talk about having a high sex drive. I, mm -hmm. I talk about the not always in the mood addressing that piece. Yeah. But, you know, even what are you getting from sex? Why are you in the mood right now? What's turning you on? I'm not really feeling it. So I'm kind of curious what, what's going on in your end that you're I excited about sex right now. Or, yeah. you know, you've kind of like... I thought you would have been interested. You know, I put on some lingerie or I'm kind of kissing you and kind of setting the stage and you're not really taking the bait. Like, is something going on? Are you doing okay? Is there something that you want to talk about? Um, yeah. So I think just being curious and just asking and leaving space for those possibilities um, is, is critical. <laughs> um, and again, we want these things to go both ways, but I think it's really absent when it comes to talking about men's sexual desire. Yeah. And I think even just the awareness is a great starting point. Um, Esther Perel has this wonderful quote, sex is the sanctioned language for men to talk about their feelings. It's the keyhole through which men can access all of the forbidden emotions like love, surrender, vulnerability, connection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's also the only sanctioned language for them to talk about those forbidden emotions with other men. 
And, you know, in your book, you illuminate that exactly what Esther said. For a lot of men, sex is the sanctioned language for them to tap into these emotions. And so if you are in a long-term relationship, and let's say in the case of the woman, for whatever reason, you're not in the mood, I think it's helpful to know if a man is making a bid for sex Mm -hmm. and you're not in the mood and it ain't happening, it could be a great avenue to open up some investigation about, well, is there a deeper emotion that he's trying to tap into through sex? And is there a way that we could, that I could meet his needs, you know, in a different way? Absolutely. One of the things when I did my larger online study, I asked men, um, you know, what's the biggest thing that we're getting wrong as a society about men's sexual desire? And one of the most common things that came up was that men were saying that we only get our physical needs met through sex. Like they were saying how important it was. They got this emotional connection. They felt close. They could be vulnerable. They could let their guards down. Um, You know, they, they really talked about how there was this emotional bid for connection. And I think sometimes for women, and particularly, I, I find when women have a partner who has maybe a higher sexual desire than she does, or maybe he initiates sex at a time where she's not really feeling it, it can feel kind of confusing. We can sometimes think like, you must just be horny. It has nothing to do with me, right? Like you just mm-hmm. got turned on and you just want to get off. And it, it's, it, you know, we can kind of, you know, keep it all over there instead of allowing some of those softer pieces and saying, maybe you want to feel closer to me. Maybe you want to feel more connected. Maybe this is your way of experiencing that intimacy. And if we can kind of leave a little space and curiosity for that, um, then, then we, we don't necessarily have to have sex. If you're not in the mood to have sex, that's fine. Mm-hmm. But I think it's important to address that there's that emotional connection sometimes that's kind of being reached for, that he's maybe asking for. And, you know, a lot of the times in, in my therapeutic um, practice, there's the, this important part of saying, well, okay, maybe I'm not in the mood for sex right now. Maybe I don't feel like that physical um, desire, but perhaps, you know, do you want to talk? Do you want to cuddle on the couch? Or maybe I can kind of like warm up to the idea and maybe approach it later. Um, Mm -hmm. But I think what we really don't want to be doing is missing that there is often that emotional bid for connection, right? It makes us feel closer. It makes us feel more connected. Um, and, And if we perceive our male partner as initiating sex as just a physical need, we tend to kind of reject a, a yeah. little harsher, you know, oh, forget it, buddy. Like what you're in the mood now, like not happening. Yeah. Um, and, and instead, if we can recognize that often there is that emotional bid, they want to feel closer. They want that, that connection. Um, we can still say no, but often we do it in like a much kinder, more relational enhancing way. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. I was listening to a really interesting interview between Esther Perel and Dax Shepard. He has a podcast called armchair therapist, I believe. Okay. And, and she was saying that many men know the sexual acts that they like, but not the meaning that they give them and why they like them. She mm-hmm. said the erotic is the world of meaning that we place on sex. And if you really want to get to know your partner, get to know them erotically. And I feel like that's kind of another avenue that we can use to, if for whatever reason, sex is off the table, like really understanding, you know, even asking your partner, like when we have sex, like, what does that give you? In the case of Dak Shepard, who was the host of Armchair Therapist, he's like, for me, it's a really important source of validation. He's Mm -hmm. like, that's why I would never go to a prostitute because there's payment involved and I don't get that need met. But when I'm with my partner and she chooses me, I get that sense of validation that's so important. So having that candid conversation and finding out from your partner, like, what is the meaning that you get from this? Um, And then you could find another way to fulfill that need or meet that need. And it's interesting that you use that word validated. Um, That's not one of the, like, key chapters in my book or one of the key themes necessarily, that word. But what it immediately brings up for me is one of the key things that came up um, over the course of, like, all my research and my therapy is men's desire to feel desired. And so Mm. a lot of men talked about how that was such a key thing for them during sex is that kind of the lead up, the build up, this idea that she was interested in being with me on that level made him feel wanted and increased self-esteem. Um, you know, like men really hit home that this was so critical. So what happened during sex, it happened like with a female being like an enthusiastic partner that mm-hmm, made them feel mm-hmm. good about themselves. But they also talked about how that showed up way earlier than sex. It happened with flirting. It happened because of 
you know, just like romantic touch, you know, even just a kiss or a, a back rub, like sometimes those things vanish from our relationship and it makes us kind of doubt, um, you know, are you still as into me as you used to? Do you still care mm -hmm. about me the same way you used to? And so I think there's a lot of things that happen in and around sex and also actually during sexual activity that really make us feel wanted, desired, respected, cared for. Um, and, and I think it's worth understanding, like you said, what we, we get from sex, what our partner's getting from sex and helping to kind of bridge that, that, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I agree. And I think actually what you just shared is really empowering for women, because just like men are told by society, they need to be the initiators and there's a lot of pressure and potential rejection that goes along with that. Mm -hmm. Um, I think on the flip side, women are told don't initiate, you know, let him come to you. Mm -hmm. And that's not always a fun position to be in. You know, sometimes it can be really fun to initiate. And um, when I read that aspect of your book, I'm like, that's actually a really em like empowering knowledge to have. Yeah, I, I'm glad that you brought that up. And I mean, that's my, um, my honest perspective about it is that, you know, we are raised, we can say that things are changing and sure things are changing, but still most women would say that they were taught to be demure and a bit mm -hmm. more passive. And like you said, wait for him to come to you. And a lot mm -hmm. of men talk about being rewarded or even pressured, even in a negative way to be the initiator, to kind of pursue sex, pursue sexual um, partners. They are, you know, socially rewarded in that sense. Um, but a lot of men in my research and, you know, again, in therapy, talk about how tired they are of that one-sided, like, mm. pursuer-pursuey dynamic, yeah. that they're, they're always the one doing the wooing, planning the dates, initiating sex, hey, yeah. do you want me, and waiting to see if there's, like, a yes in response. And they talked about how, you know, they're really setting them, themselves up for, like, the pain of rejection. Like, what if you don't want me? What if you say yeah. no? Um, and that gets hard, and it, it kind of, men talked about how it just, like, really wears down on them. Yeah. Um, but the other side of it is I really do believe I've seen women kind of light up at this possibility of saying, whoa, what if we had sex when I wanted? Like sometimes mm -hmm. I ask women like, well, when do you like having sex? And a lot of times like women I've spoken to like don't even know the answer to that because it's always been responsive to him initiating. And yeah. so all of a sudden to have space to say, oh, well, actually I feel desire on like, you know, more in the morning than in the evening. And, you know, just the possibility of being like, well, what if you initiate at that point? Um, and it's just really fascinating. I've, I've seen it time and time again, where women get kind of excited to be given permission to step into that sexual, um, the, into their full sexual capacity to be like, it's okay to, it feels good. And it's relationship enhancing, like win-win. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And, and just like we kind of said before, like it doesn't make a man less of a man not to initiate and it doesn't make a woman less of a woman to initiate which I think no, is absolutely. really really liberating so mm -hmm. Viri just brought up a question that I was actually really looking forward to asking you okay so Esther has this quote and someone in the group just hit an entire thread on this quote in particular because it's really powerful and she goes you won't hear a woman say nothing turns me on more than to see him turned on and then I think sometimes she'll flippantly say like men have had hard-ons for centuries and women could care less and then she said what turns her on is to be the turn on that's the big secret of female sexuality it's massively narcissistic mm -hmm. and when I read that I'm like yeah that makes sense like I definitely I can relate to getting turned on when I feel like I am the turn on to a man and I think mm. the flip side would be a lot of men get turned on when they win the woman over after, you know, a bit of a chase or a challenge. Yeah. Um, but so, so I think that that, to me, that's true. And yet at the same time, men also want to be desired. And I'm curious how you would maybe reconcile those two potentially competing truths. Yeah, I mean, I think like just that example for, for women, the, the, the power or the empowering feeling that comes and feeling you know, I turned him on, right? Like it feels exciting to say if we're so inclined to wear something a little sexier, a little nicer, a little um, suggestive, and then kind of get that, um, you know, the look, the touch, mm -hmm. the, the excitement, right? It's empowering. Um, yeah. You know, and I think there is something to be said for that side of it where it's like, you know, okay, men put themselves out there and then there's that validation or that excitement or that desirability that comes from like, oh, yeah. she wants me back. 
Yeah. Um, but to be honest, um, men in, in my research often talk about how they wanted, um, you know, compliments on their physical appearance, that they don't mm. get that enough. And so they actually described um, in a lot of cases, you know, liking when their female partner gave them a compliment about his body or what he was wearing or that he looked good recently. Mm. That they're, you know, some even talked about their insecurities that maybe showed up as they got older, that it wasn't necessarily mm -hmm. um, the fact that they didn't care about how they looked. They actually really, really enjoyed when their female partner, um, you know, gave them those compliments and kind of like approached him or gave him that look. Mm. And so I think there is something to be said. I mean, we're still, you know, men and women have been raised in different ways. And so maybe is it exactly the same? You know, maybe time will tell, maybe more research needs to be done in that sense. But I do really yeah. get the sense that you know, men really um, can like the idea of kind of putting in a little more effort or, you know, mm -hmm. working out or wearing something that's a little more, you know, attractive or sexy and getting that validation from their female partner to say, mm -hmm. I notice, you know, and for them, you know, over the course of my research, again, these men are describing like, that's actually a big turn on for them to be like, ooh, she's turned on by me and not having to like necessarily be always the one who's working for it that they're the one who's kind of objectified in that sense. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if there's a way to reconcile as much as just say it could be like a both and situation. Yes. Like I think yeah. both can be true depending on the circumstances. Yeah. 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 But a great and question. May maybe um, in the early stages of a relationship versus in a long-term relationship, it might be a little different. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe Esther's quote was a little bit more relevant to the early stages where in a long-term relationship showing that mutual desire, you know, is important fuel for the fire. Absolutely. And I think at the beginning of a relationship, I know you gave that example on the beach early on, but mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people do report playing a little bit more into those gendered roles earlier yeah. on. And then as you get more comfortable and, you know, more time passes, then it's like, well, do we really need to do it that way? Or can we kind of yeah. come up with our own relationship code for how we like, you know, engaging with one another and interacting and that maybe that leaves space to kind of go against the, the norms of what we've been taught our whole lives. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's such a great point. So I, I mentioned at the very beginning of this video that I'm doing this course that Esther has. It's a video course online called Rekindling Desire. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things she brings up is oftentimes we'll create stories because, you know, it was a Tuesday at 5 p.m. and the partner wasn't in the mood to do X sexual act in this place. And then we think that they're just not interested in ever doing that sexual act where it really could have been just at that very time on that very day, they weren't interested. And that's why I think it's so important to, you know, have these ongoing dialogues and candid conversations. Yeah. One of our previous Facebook lives was with this incredible couple, um, Caleb Spalding and Lavina Lee, and okay. they're in their late twenties. Um, they've been together for just over a year and they created this beautiful journal called a sex journal for couples. I actually got it for some friends of mine who were, uh, who just got married. Okay. Um, and es essentially it was inspired by their own practice where every time they had sex, they would each independently journal about the experience and then they'd come together and read each other their entries and it opened up these amazing conversations about things that they never would have known about their partners, awareness about themselves, and just this incredible depth to their relationship. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's another great tool. Like if you're looking to go deeper with your partner, a sex journal, a sex journal for couples um, has wonderful prompts and, and questions and um, just kind of a roadmap for that. So mm -hmm. highly recommend that. Yeah, that's a great activity. And I really like how that touches in on, like you said, the case by case, right? Like, why were you feeling it that day and not the other day? Or you're into kind of something a little more, you know, soft or a little more kinky or, or you know, however it shifts. But we, we do, we change day by day, month by month as we get older. So yeah, it's, it, I think it's helpful to kind of be checking in that frequently. Yeah. And there's something really validating about just making this commitment, like, when we have sex, we're going to reflect on it and we're going to share with each other. Mm -hmm. And it almost gives the people permission to share things that they might, you know, feel uncomfortable doing otherwise. Yes. 
And even though um, you know the content of this conversation is assumptions we make about men's sexual desire, um, I think it's you know well known that we make a lot of assumptions about our own sexuality, about our partner's sexuality, um, on many many levels. And so yeah. the more that we're actually asking questions and being curious versus you know defaulting to those assumptions, um, the better. There's no question. Yeah, and even like the forced time for reflection, oftentimes we don't have that awareness unless we reflect. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes after the act of sex, you're not reflecting on the who, what, where, when, and why of that experience. So I think there's something really like conscious and intentional about carving out that space and making mm -hmm. it kind of like a, a sacred thing that we always do. Yeah. Um, that's, that's powerful as well, just for being aware of your own experience and your own preferences. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I did want to give people in the group, uh, in the feed, an opportunity to ask questions. So if sure. you do have a question for Sarah, go ahead and throw it in the comments. Um, but I did want to ask you about, um, I had two different areas that I was curious about. Um, so okay. the first is sexual trauma. Um, I know at least one in 10 boys and men have experienced sexual trauma, and that number is probably very underreported. And so I'm curious if there were any, um, any nuggets from your research that you picked up about how to, uh, if your partner has experienced sexual trauma, you know, how do you navigate that as a couple and create a safe and healing space for the partner? Mm-hmm. Um, really great question. Um, you know, the sexual trauma didn't come up um, organically um, very often. Um, and I didn't ask about it, um, you know, in my online study as directly. That wasn't like a main key question. There's space that people could talk about it if it felt yeah. relevant, but that wasn't where I really dug into. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, uh, you know, when men do experience sexual trauma, when they have been um, sexually assaulted or, um, you know, young, more recently in life, um, you know, it certainly plays a role in their comfort being sexual. And I mean, I think that, you know, that comes as no surprise, you know, mm -hmm. we know a lot more about women's experiences. Um, but I think it's just about, um, you know, being as open and transparent as you feel comfortable. I think for men to be able to, if they're in a relationship where they're able to kind of disclose, not necessarily every detail if they're not there yet, but just say, you know, I've got this traumatic past and, you know, sometimes maybe sex is difficult for me. I don't feel so safe in that environment. Um, I think it's really just about creating as safe of a space, being as understanding as possible, checking in as often as possible, perhaps more often than you might otherwise with mm -hmm. someone who doesn't have that background. Um, you know, as much as possible, trying to remember, like, this is not that, like, we've got our own safe, you know, situation. If there's ever something, if you hit a trigger, if there's ever a reminder or a touch, um, you know, a flashback, just, you know, pause, let's just kind of hold each other, stay connected mm -hmm. and, you know, revisit it down the road. Um, so I don't necessarily have research that kind of touches on that so explicitly. Um, that would be more from my therapeutic experience that, um, yeah. you know, it's really about making sure that people feel safe, that there's a chance to say no, that that no is respected, mm. um, and, and just not to have any of that, that pressure expectations, um, particularly being sensitive that there could be some flashbacks and, um, re-traumatization if, if, if needs aren't respected. Yeah. yeah. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, I'm actually doing, I'm doing a couple courses now, <laughs> as oh, I okay. tend to. Um, one of the other courses I'm doing is led by Dr. Shafali Sabari. She's a therapist. She's known as being a parenting expert, but she's also really, really well-versed in conscious relationships. And her current course is called Free to Be. And I know that several of the group members are taking it along with me. And in addition to doing a one hour module every week, she also does a one hour videotape session of um, couples therapy okay. uh, with, with a couple that's opted in to, to do this work. And the man had experienced uh, several different types of sexual abuse at a very young age. And she did this incredibly powerful exercise with his inner child mm -hmm. where she went back in time to that event um, and, and essentially spoke to and communicated with the, you know, four-year-old version of him and asked that four-year-old version, the feelings that he was experiencing, you know, he had a lot of shame that he hadn't stopped the act. Mm -hmm. Um, and she essentially helped him see that he didn't have the knowledge or capabilities at the time to stop it. And it wasn't his responsibility to stop it. And it wasn't his fault that he didn't. 
Yeah. Um, and there was just, a, you know, there was a, a big emotional release and it was cool to see his partner be there with him and just kind of hold that space um, and take a lot of, um, I don't know the right word. It wasn't pride, but I could see like the respect growing and the mm -hmm. attraction building as he did this like inner work. It was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, and that shame is a big piece and, and quite common, you know, to to be an older, you know, man and kind of look back and say, well, I should have stopped it. It's like, well, we didn't have the, the strength yeah. and ability and power that we do now and, and to, to, you know, reconcile those thoughts, what was really possible at that time versus what you think you might be able to do yeah. in circumstances now. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I think that there can be a lot of shame even if we didn't experience abuse, but even like when I've looked back on how I've acted in past relationship experiences, sure. and I've I felt shame like that I didn't have the skills that I do now to handle it differently, Absolutely. but we never would have been inspired to get those skills unless we had the experience in the first place. So I think there's kind of a level of self-compassion that needs to come as we grow and evolve. Yeah, certainly, certainly. Great. So my final question I wanted to ask was around, I don't like the term erectile dysfunction, but let's mm -hmm. just say challenges with male sexual performance. Yeah. Um, and I'm curious if that came up at all in um, your interviews with men. Um, and you're welcome to also talk anonymously about, you know, therapeutic experiences that you've had with your patients. And, you know, when there is the, um, a challenge of some element of lack of sexual, sexual performance, um, you know, there's the experience itself, and then the, there's the story we create about it. And I'm mm -hmm. curious if you have any um, advice or stories you can share in case anyone listening um, is in that situation themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, um, I think men who struggle with um, erections um, to whatever degree and whatever label they choose to use around it, um, it I mean, it's very, very common. Um, and one of the things that I've noticed, particularly around some of the myths that I talk about in my book and over the course of my research, is that um, it, there's really this pressure component that comes with it. Um, so, for example, when we have this idea that men should always be interested in sex, you should always be ready to go. Any time that a man doesn't meet that need, it's like, well, why don't you have an erection? Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the things that I find quite common in heterosexual relationships is, um, you know, we think that men should always, not just that they should always be in the mood, but they should want more sex than their female partner. Mm -hmm. um, but we know from the research is that, you know, in any heterosexual partnership or when a man and a woman are dating, men are no more likely to be the partner with higher sexual desire than, than the woman. And so it's incredibly common for a woman to want just as much sex as her male partner or actually want more sex than her, than her male partner. Um, and so what I find is that when there's a woman who's more interested in sex, when she's got a higher libido, when she's kind of saying, hey, I'm ready to go, um, if men aren't, for natural reasons, just normal variation between men, um, that they feel like, oh, I should have an erection. Like she wants mm -hmm. to go, I should be in the mm -hmm. mood, it should be there. And then they start kind of questioning um, what's wrong with me, what's going on. And I, I see actually a lot of men in my practice who have gone through like seeing a doctor, sometimes a naturopath, you know, they've tried to exercise better, eat better. They think that there's something like kind of like biological. Mm -hmm. Their doctor tells them, you know what, nothing's going on there. Like everything's functioning just fine. You know, you can ask a couple questions like, can you get an erection? Like, do you get an erection in the morning? Do you get an erection like just kind of casually through the day if you're thinking sexually? In a lot of cases of, in my experience, men will say, yes, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. that pressure that shows up with their partner that they're not in the mood at the right time, that there's this pressure to maybe um, perform and satisfy that they're like more responsible for providing pleasure mm -hmm. and maybe they're worried that they can do it or they're, they're worried that they might not be able to succeed as well in that area that it's that pressure that kind of like overthinking maybe some anxiety or anxious kind of thoughts um, yeah. that can play into not being able to get an erection or be able to maintain it um, and so I think what it stems back to a lot is this idea, like I should want sex right now. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's not necessarily anything that's going, it's not a real, you know, biological problem or something to be overly concerned about. It's kind of like you were using that language or being self-compassion, understanding yourself, mm -hmm. being in a respectful relationship where you can ask questions. Say, yeah. Oh, okay. So you're not in the mood right now. What if their partner responded like that and was compassionate with us and said, you know, okay, so maybe not now, maybe later. Is there anything I could do that would help you get a bit more in the mood right now? Is there anything you need from me? Um, 
But if we think about the pressure that we might be putting on our male partner, if we're going under that assumption, you should want sex, you should want sex immediately, turning you on should be easy because turning men on should be easy, um, then we're just kind of falling into that same um, you know, stereotype that we're, we're trying so hard to break here. At least yeah. like, I feel like I'm on a mission to break here. Yeah. Um, so I think that's, that's part of it, right? Is that added pressure, that added inner dialogue that I'm not good enough, I'm not pleasing you, there's something wrong with me that I don't want sex right now. Yeah. Um, and then the other part um, that I notice kind of, not that there's only these two examples, but they're kind of the ones that stand out most um, saliently for me right now, is when there is that, um, that lack of emotional connection. So mm. I've worked with men who, um, one particular gentleman's coming to mind for me that he was dating again after, um, after being married for several, several years, got divorced and then had just kind of entered the dating pool again. And he was saying that his, uh, the woman that he'd been dating for a little bit, I mean, they were kind of in the like early, maybe a few weeks to a couple months, mm -hmm. was really interested in having sex. And he was finding that he couldn't have an erection around her. He yeah. was like really nervous. Yeah. And we just started talking a little bit and it, it became evident for him that that lack of emotional connection, particularly for him when he left the relationship where that was so, I mean, obviously the relationship didn't end up, you know, it, you know, they ended the relationship. Right. There was still that connection, that closeness, that safety, that intimacy. And all of a sudden he's like dating casually and he's like, mm -hmm. it's not there for me anymore. Yeah. And it's hard for me to get an erection right now. Like it's just, it doesn't feel totally safe. Yeah. Um, and so I think those are two big things that I've kind of noticed as like themes over the course of um, both my research and clinical practice of, of when men have, you know, problems with erections that really aren't that, you know, you can see a doctor about, but it's more that psychological, that emotional side, that, that connection that's missing or feeling that, you know, my female partner wants sex right now. So there's something wrong with me that I don't, that must mean I have an erectile dysfunction right. versus that I just maybe I'm not in the mood at this particular moment, or I'm not in the mood as often as she is. Yeah. yeah. I know personally there have been experiences where I've had sex and it has felt like the man is trying to put on a performance for me. Mm -hmm. And those have been like the least meaningful experiences. And I yeah. feel like there's just this myth that's perpetuated in our society that women, you know, want to be performed for, or they want like a porn like experience. Whereas the, the experiences I've had, and they might not even have been sexual, but they were, you know, erotic and, um, and, and highly connected, um, experiences, like those are the ones that stand out in my mind. Mm -hmm. Um, and I could even envision if I was, let's say hypothetically, I was with a man in a long-term relationship and there was a time when, whether it was work stress or something emotional going on, or he just wasn't in the mood and I was in the mood, like there's such a huge spectrum of things you can do that aren't just penis and vagina or other orifices that are super erotic and intimate. Um, mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of Tantra and obviously it's not for everyone, but that's just kind of a great framework for, for that. And obviously the pleasure mechanics, um, erotic essentials course that I mentioned at the beginning mm -hmm. of the video as well. Um, there's so many ways that you can have a highly sexual experience and it doesn't have to involve like the act of penetration. Absolutely. We put so much um, pressure or like so much of our focus, I suppose, on a man's erection, right? Mm -hmm. it, when he gets one, okay, we probably should engage in some sexual activity. Mm -hmm. When he loses one, okay, then it's done. Yeah. Um, and I think far too many couples or, you know, relationships, not necessarily couples, um, you know, struggle because of, of that, right? I mean, we can engage in very sensual, sexual, kinky things before an erection, after an erection, with an erection, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. obviously there's lots of couples where there's no penis at all and they're still having ex very, very exciting sex. And so, mm -hmm. you know, we put so much, particularly when there's a man and a woman in a relationship, um, so much pressure on, you know, when he gets an erection, how hard it is, how long it lasts. Um, and I think it's to the detriment of, of men and their, their partners. I agree. There's a quote that I absolutely love that I want to read. Um, from Esther, because it ha has everything to do with this. So she says, animals have sex. It is a primary urge and it is procreative. Humans have an erotic life. We are the only creatures who can experience something entirely erotic without it ever happening. The imagined experience can be just as powerful as the real one. The erotic is sexuality transformed by the human imagination. In that sense, it is infinite. That's mm -hmm. one of my favorite quotes of hers of all time. 
a um, great one. <laughs> yeah, and it just goes to show like we have this infinite potential just through our imagination, and I feel like it's so undertapped. Mm-hmm. Yeah, couldn't agree more. <laughs> So we're almost at time. We did have a question from um, one of our viewers. Okay. So this is from Viri. She said, what advice would you give to a man who was raised in a household where sex was never discussed? And in fact, it was seen as, you know, people who have sex are sluts or they're sex addicts. And it's led <clears throat> that person to have a low sex drive or a low libido. Um, she said, I bring this up because it's often more common to see women having feelings of shame around sex and not as common for men. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, where my mind uh, immediately goes with that, and thank you so much for your question, is um, th there's a lot that I've, I've been aware of with men, and this would be a little bit more in my therapeutic practice than my, my research specifically, but there's a lot of men, I think, who are aware that there's this really toxic idea of men's sexuality right now, um, mm -hmm. particularly within the Me Too or post Me Too or however we're kind of talking about it at this stage. Yeah. But but it, it, there really was this idea, and, and I think we're still talking about how men, their their sexual sexuality is kind of dangerous or... Um, or gross, or it, there's something negative about it, right? We're, yeah. There's there's a lot more um, language around that, and so what I've seen more and more are men who are really struggling to reconcile within themselves. Like, is it okay for me to have a sexual interest? Because I keep hearing like that men are, you know, abusing their power with sexuality, or their, yeah. um, you know, their high interest is an addiction, or there's all these problems on that side of the spectrum. And mm -hmm. so I'm seeing more and more men kind of saying, what is the healthy way to express my sexuality? Because, you know, if it's too low, that's a problem. If it's too mm -hmm. high, that's a problem. So where's that like healthy, you know, middle ground that's okay, that makes me not a monster, that makes me not um, scary. And, and mm -hmm. I think that's just a really, um, unfortunate situation or it's a really like unfortunate yeah. state of like events that we're like that we're in right now socially where we don't really know what's okay and what's permissible and what's safe and what's you know like I mean we know when it's obviously bad there's no mm -hmm. question right assault is assault and rape is rape and I mean there's mm -hmm. that yeah but just I, I'm talking about men who are in consensual relationships with you know a partner they've been together with for years and they're still oh, yeah. wondering they're like am I being too forceful? Like, I don't want to scare you. I don't want to do anything that would remind you of kind of what we're seeing on the media. And so I do see a lot of men kind of pulling back in their own expressions of their sexuality. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's healthy to be doing, you know, we don't want, like, if you're a, in a boardroom and you were smacking someone's behind, yeah. yes, you should pull back from that behavior. But I'm talking about men in long-term relationships who have been doing things in a way that felt consensual and respectful, but now we're all of a sudden feeling that their sexuality is maybe a little scary and they're, they're struggling to figure out like, what is the, like, is this okay? And, and so yeah. I guess all I would say is, I think it's important to always be questioning to make sure that our partner is on board, that we're feeling yeah. comfortable with what we're doing, that we're on the same page. And again, it just goes to checking in, is this working for you, right? Mm -hmm. How do we have maybe forceful or kinky sex that still we're, you're still on board, I'm still on board, this is okay, this is working for you, okay, perfect, right? Like, and then it's like, then the, you keep going. But the yep. idea that, you know, I'm, I'm hearing more and more men kind of struggling with asking themselves, is this okay, am I okay, or is me just being a man with a sex drive threatening? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's, that's like even hard for me to hear. Like, it, it just, it feels so wrong that someone would ever question something they're feeling you know, would be not okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm here to say today that it's okay. And I think <laughs> the key, like you said, is it's having the conversation. I feel like on the one hand, we're inundated with sex, you know, mm -hmm. and on the other hand, there's so much shame and silence around it. Um, and if you, if you are in a partnership with someone or even dating, it's like, there's nothing bad or wrong about having a conversation about the thing that you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. there are tools out there like a sex journal for couples or like the podcast, um, you know, speaking of sex with the pleasure mechanics that I linked up in the comments. Like there's so many great tools out there to learn more about sexuality, to facilitate these conversations. So, um, so thank you so much for sparking this conversation tonight. Um, thanks to everyone who joined us. As a reminder, our next Facebook Live, it's going to be with Chris Maxwell, who's the founder and host of Speaking of Sex with the Pleasure Mechanics. 
check out her website, check out some of her podcasts in advance of the Facebook Live. She's interviewed Dr. Justin Laymiller, who we've had on here. She's interviewed Esther Perel. She's interviewed Emily Nagoski, who's often mentioned in the group. So she has incredible interviews and she has her free Erotic Essentials online course, 25 modules. I'm definitely gonna check it out. Um, so as a closing question, um, you guys know me, I tend to be a little bit more on the provocative and very open side. Um, and so I'm going to invite you to answer this question if you feel comfortable, which is, I thought it was just me. And you could use this in reference to the sexual realm or anything else that's feeling a little bit heavy in your world. The one thing I know about shame is that it thrives in secrecy. And when we share things with each other, that's when the shame can dissipate. So if there's anything that's heavy on your heart that you wanna share with our safe community, feel free to share it in the comments. And I'll go ahead and post the video replay in the group. Thank you so much to Sarah for number one, taking on this really important topic. Number two, spending your Sunday evening with us. And we'll see you all soon. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Sarah. Bye.